So I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Juliana Fanus, and I'm a project coordinator for the Green Municipal Fund at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And we're back today with a different edition um, of the series on best practices in municipal sustainability. Each week we've been covering a different sector, but today we're going to be focusing particularly on solid waste management. Although this webinar is offered in English, you're all welcome to ask questions in French as well. And if you do have colleagues that are missing today's webinar, the session is also being recorded and it should be live on our FCM YouTube channel in just a few weeks. Um, but just in case you haven't attended the past few sessions, I'm going to do another quick recap of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities as well as the Green Municipal Fund. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities is also known as FCM, and it's the national voice of municipal government with diverse programs and services that are designed to support municipalities. Our largest program is the Green Municipal Fund, also known as GMF. It's a $1 billion program funded by the Government of Canada to support municipal efforts to improve air, water, and soil quality. Our fund is open to all municipalities, large and small, uh, in every province and territory. So our fund has a double mission, one to support initiatives and sustainable development through funding, but also uh, to share knowledge and lessons learned through online resources and tools, through trainings, peer learning activities, and networking opportunities, among others. The Green Municipal Fund is currently available for projects in five different sectors, including energy performance, waste reduction, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the session, ground fields, transportation, and water performance. If you want to learn a little bit more about the types of initiatives that we funded in the past, our approved projects database is a wealth of resources on our funded projects. It has case studies, reports, contact information, and so on. So I'd encourage you to check it out. We'll be sending a link uh, through the chat box fun function. Another point uh, is to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, FCM Connect. Some of you may have joined the webinar through this newsletter, but it's a great way to stay up to date on funding, training, and other things that we have to offer. We also strongly encourage you to apply for FCM's 2020 Sustainable Communities Awards before the March 31st deadline. So this is a great opportunity for you to showcase your innovative local sustainability projects and we, we give awards in nine different categories, including waste among other sectors. So check out another link coming your way. Which reminds me, you should all consider coming to join local leaders from across the country for FCM's 2020 Sustainable, Sustainable Communities Conference. It's taking place October 20th to 22nd uh, in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's an opportunity for us all to celebrate GMF's 20th anniversary. The program will deliver relevant content that brings fresh insights into the community challenges that we're all currently facing today. And you'll also benefit from in-depth knowledge on how to access GMF's new funding offer. Registration for the conference opens March 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. So just to take um, a quick look into the waste management issues that some of you are facing today, um, we can see that many of you are concerned with a wide range of issues, including recycling, contamination, diversion, food waste, among others. So hopefully today's session will provide you with some ideas on how to address these issues. So today's webinar is actually the fourth of the five part webinar series, and it's intended to demonstrate and showcase how Canadian communities are tackling their environmental challenges by launching these innovative projects across each of GMF's five sectors. In this session in particular, you're gonna learn about key factors that affect municipalities' progress in achieving efficiency in the waste sector, but also about leading edge best practices with high triple bottom line benefits and strong potential to transform municipal activities. The reports for waste, water, and uh, land use are now available on our website. We're gonna be sending you a direct link for the waste report since today's session will shed light on some of those research findings, as well as profile Guelph Wellington's food waste pilot. And at the very end of the session, as I mentioned earlier, we're briefly gonna go through a few of GMF's funding opportunity for the waste sector. 
So we're fortunate, enough, fortunate to be joined today uh, by our two panelists. We have with us today Lori Giroux from Giroux Environmental Consulting and Joanne St. Goddard from Recycling Council of Ontario. Thank you both for joining us today. Before I turn the floor over to the two of you, there's just a few housekeeping items. Similar to the previous format from last week, um, Lori will present for 15 minutes, followed by Joanne's 15 minute presentation. And we'll have about another 15 minutes or so left for questions. And at the end, we'll do a quick funding overview. Please send us your questions through the chat functions and we'll respond to them once the presentations are complete and we'll try to move through as many of these as we can. So first we're gonna start off with Lori. Lori is the director and business owner of Jehu Environmental Consulting, located in the national capital region of Ontario. She has been a professional environmental consultant for 21 years. Prior to owning her own business, she was a senior consultant with Marbeck Resource Consultants and with ICF International, both in Ottawa. She specializes in waste policy, extend producer responsibility programs, hazardous waste and environmentally sound management approaches, as well as chemicals and products. Lori has a master's degree in environmental studies from Dalhousie University and a bachelor's degree in environment and resource study from Trent University. So Lori, we're passing control over, over to you now. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much, Juliana. All right, thank you. Great, so thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I've got about uh, 15 minutes to give some highlights of some of the trends we identified and the best practice themes that we identified when we did a research scan for FCM last year. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the work we did for FCM last year, uh, identify some of the key trends that we're expected to be uh, seeing over the longer term, so at least over the next 10 years, uh, some of the samples of the best practice approaches that we have identified and we did our research, and we'll identify some of the key success factors that uh, really contribute to this progress in this area. So for our consulting team that were, uh, we were uh, a team of five individuals, Dr. Mary Trudeau with Envirings was our manager. I was the lead researcher and we had some support from three other independent consultants who I regularly work with, uh, Renee Drolet, Selena fraser Ravai, and Samantha Roulette. So our objectives for our scan for FCM were to identify um, what's happening in municipalities, both in Canada and internationally, in terms of what are the next uh, new big things that are happening in the waste sector for municipalities, what's affecting them, what are the key challenges, and what are some of the leading approaches out there that could help uh, inform FCM about this sector in particular and help them um, you know, understand it a little bit more in terms of supporting the fund that they have offering. So we were asked to look at some approaches that really align well with the FCM strategic plan. So to us, that uh, gave us a bit of a framework and we're, in terms of the three R's hierarchy, we really looked for practices that focused on the top three levels, look, practices that were focusing on waste reduction, waste reuse, um, and recycling primarily. So we're looking to find uh, these sorts of practices that we're doing things a little bit differently, not just the same old uh, systems in place. So of primary interest to the FCM were practices with triple bottom line approaches, or benefits, I should say. So approaches that included environmental benefits, specifically greenhouse gas reductions, as well as reducing waste overall, contributing to uh, green, uh, benefits. Um, economic benefits uh, were also pr practices that were having a cost savings for municipalities or cost savings for individuals, um, asset sharing opportunities for municipalities, as well as social benefits. So uh, increasing capacity among municipalities, increasing community awareness about waste, um, and any other social benefits that could be realized along with the more obvious environmental benefits of waste reduction. So the little circle or the little uh, rounded triangle in the center of that diagram where those three types of benefits intersect, environmental, economic and social, those were uh, the types of approaches we were looking for. So although there's lots of 
great uh, waste reduction projects out there, if they didn't include a component of economic benefit and a social benefit, we didn't really include it in our study. So we were really looking for things that addressed all three types of benefits together because these sorts of approaches are a bit more effective in transforming um, the waste issue. So how did we do our scan? We had uh, three months to do a scan. We looked at published literature targeting Canada, the US and the European Union. We did 17 interviews with municipalities, both in Canada and abroad. We did some analysis and submitted our report and a presentation to FCM at the end of last March. So what did we identify in terms of the long-term trends? I'll go through these. Uh, they're, they're more detailed trends are available in the summary report that Juliana referenced, but I'll just give you some of the highlights. We've got some mandatory uh, instruments that have been used for a long time for banning or restricting certain materials from landfill. This is something that we're seeing continue and with designated recyclables uh, in certain jurisdictions, landfill bans have been quite effective in really reducing the amount of waste going to landfill. And one of the key trends in the same area using mandatory instruments for organic waste diversion, it's definitely something that some municipalities and some provinces, including province-wide, have banned organic waste from entering landfill. One of the key changes that we're noticing is that some of the leading jurisdictions are including both ICI waste with residential waste. In, in these bands. So that's the one of the more uh, effective instruments in terms of getting overall volume away from being deposited in landfills and heading towards composting facilities or recycling facilities, depending on what the waste is. Second mandatory instrument also has an economic uh, component, deposit return uh, systems. Uh, with an incentive to return bottles in the jurisdictions that have these systems in place for a long time. They're very, very effective with high return rates and these programs are expected to continue in the long term. And lastly on my list here is uh, extended cruise responsibility for products or packaging at end of life. It's a trend that started probably about 20 years ago with certain key um, products that were restricted from landfill. Uh, and would be things like used oil or paint. Uh, and over the years, other, other products, packaging, such as uh, tires and uh, plastic metal tin packaging have all also been designated as EPR. So one of the key uh, uh, ways that municipalities are able to, oh, oh, sorry about that, uh, support, support uh, waste reduction uh, with, with support from provincial policy that designates these materials as EPR. Uh, this slide just gives a little bit of a background about what EPR means in case people are not familiar with it. I thought I'd include a little slide that shows um, what it is. Basically, the, the box on the left is when a municipality is 100% uh, funding that recycling or collection program for a product or package. Uh, and as the moves over to the center box or the box on the right, there's more uh, producer funding for the costs associated with collection and recycling of that material. So in some jurisdictions like Ontario, there's 50-50 shared responsibility. Producers contribute 50% of the municipal costs um, and there's different formulas to reach that. But in other jurisdictions, um, I believe Quebec and, and uh, BC, uh, they're at 100% uh, funded by producers. So it really does uh, affect the municipal cost burden and it can really change um, their level of responsibility and how waste can be uh, uh, reduced in a certain municipality because with producers uh, more responsible physically and financially for the product at end of life, it does drive change. Some of the emerging trends that we've identified, uh, we've got plastic waste. All levels of government are uh, really getting involved in the plastic waste debate. We've got municipalities banning uh, plastic bag distribution, uh, and we've got some provinces banning pl plastic bag distribution, and federal government as well. Uh, last summer, uh, recent announcements on 
uh, new regulations that might be uh, drafted within the next couple of years, dealing with certain single-use plastics um, not being allowed in the marketplace. So there's a lot, a lot happening on the plastic waste pile, as well as circular economy and zero waste. We've got policies and plans uh, that are really starting to uh, be transformative from municipalities that are working on zero waste action plans. We've got, um, again, the policy of EPR approach, really driving local recycling markets, um, procurement policies, able to um, address many different types of uh, um, waste issues dealing with uh, mandatory recycled content or reuse and repair policies for equipment and furniture. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities with procurement that are associated with zero zero waste and circular economy policies. Also, food loss initiatives upstream. That's a new a new one, um, and that's an emerging trend with agriculture waste, biosolids, and organics all being addressed together through anaerobic digestion. So we've got a number of uh, new technologies that are in place that are really uh, addressing new waste streams together in a way that hasn't really been done or wasn't being done 10 years ago. And emerging uh, trends with textiles, furniture, construction, renovation are also things that we're starting to see in the larger urban centers and we're expecting those things to continue as well. Certain pilot projects for reuse, donation, repair. Oops. So, some best practice themes that we've identified and just a few examples from some of the research that we did. So circular economy is definitely a trend that we're seeing. It's become a theme with, um, with a lot of the best practices that we identified. We've got the ability to integrate procurement policies. City of Toronto was really transformative with looking at procurement using the circular economy lens and applying that to all of the procurement initiatives uh, being undertaken and seeing how they're transforming the way things are done in terms of business at the city. Similar in Amsterdam, they're using a circular economy lens to examine their construction value chain from a contracting perspective and looking at what things can they do in their procurement policies in their buying power that can change the way things are traditionally done so things aren't uh, on a linear uh, path in terms of using the resource uh, finishing and depositing it as waste we end up using this circular economy looking at our graphic here we return we reuse repair or recycle and then things get upcycled repaired recycled materials being used as a resource once again for remanufacture redistribution so procurement has been identified as a really important tool that may have been un underutilized in the past that has a lot of buying power and a lot of, a lot of circular economy um, effort can be, uh, can be in implemented in, in this tool and uh, transformative change is happening as a result. We've also identified a few interesting um, initiatives undertaken in larger cities of New York and Austin, Texas with online reuse marketplaces. Uh, these cities uh, put together uh, platforms, uh, IT platforms where uh, local partners can come together and uh, share their resources. They needed a city partner to sort of facilitate the project and get things going for them, but it really brought maybe you know 10 or 15 separate local uh, reuse initiatives that were happening uh, sporadically together into one cohesive program so there's one place one platform that a lot of <clears throat> a lot of consumers can access together in one place for reuse and and, uh, and repair shops this one slide here is Again, just to demonstrate how the circular economy lens is applied to food loss and food waste. I believe the, re the presentation right after me is going to address this in a little bit more detail. But one of the things we did uh, research and come to the conclusion is, is 
dealing with organic waste from a circular economy lens and not letting all that valuable waste in terms of food loss or organic waste after consumer use be deposited into landfills. One of the key ways to reduce GHGs from the waste sector. So addressing food loss and waste with a circular economy lens is also going to be a, a, a key, key trend in the future. All right, one of the next themes uh, that was really pervasive in some of the best practice approaches we identified was how policies can be integrated in some of the larger municipalities, the ability to use that lens of zero waste or circular economy, you know, that, that lens of uh, not letting a waste become a waste, making it a, a resource and thinking about how can it uh, not become a waste any longer. It, it's transformative among all the uh, divisions of a municipality and those municipalities that are able to inc include uh, that circular economy lens across their divisions were definitely seen as much more effective in uh, increasing capacity within the municipality to understand what that means and how they can apply that lens of reducing waste in all of their business operations. So the solid waste uh, division isn't just operating within the solid waste group, it's actually getting procurement folks to understand what circular economy means, what zero waste means. It, it, it's included in the economic uh, development plan for the city. Uh, for example, the City of Toronto uh, has you know, plans to um, have a zero waste action plan and we were able to identify you know, outreach and, and community outreach grants to uh, get pilot projects ongoing and uh, with local local partners that might uh, address uh, multi-housing uh, waste reduction issues. So we're, we're seeing these sorts of goals and action plans when they're integrated across the city uh, in many different uh, divisions of that city is really an opportunity to become transformative. So it increases the capacity of the resources across the city and the community as well. Partnerships, also a key theme in a lot of the best practice approaches we were looking at. Municipal partnerships with other municipalities, uh, community organizations, not-profit groups, recycling councils, universities or entrepreneurs, um, engaging all types of uh, local groups and neighboring municipalities together for asset sharing or testing out pilot projects, sh sharing uh, programs and, and infrastructure in order to gain economy of scale, especially in smaller organizations, is really a, a key thing that can, can drive change. We also saw a lot of evidence of both economic and mandatory instruments being used together in some of the best practices. So, um, Economic policies of interest, the pay as you throw for waste, it's something that's been around for a while, but uh, using new systems. I mean, Beaconsfield, Quebec, they've got a radio frequency technology that's fairly new and, and very interesting where um, not only do they have variable rate cans, so you pay by the size of your can that you're putting out for waste, but it's, you also pay depending on how frequently you set it out. So you may set it out once a month, you may set it out once a year or may set it out once a week whatever you use whatever type, level of service you're using is what you is what you pay for so combining the waste management um, of, of the residual waste with an economic incentive that hey you're going to pay less if you're not requiring this service as much it really can reduce costs for the city and costs for the resident on their waste bill and it reduces waste overall because at the same time the city implemented uh, organics programs and recycling programs. So there was opportunities to divert that material that was recyclable. We've got uh, differential tipping fees uh, happening in the regional district of Nanaimo to a, as an economic instrument that's uh, targeting uh, contaminated uh, waste and recycling loads or mixed loads. That's sort of an economic instrument that works in some jurisdictions. It doesn't work in all. It just depends on how the infrastructure is set up in terms of 
waste and recyclables. If it's all going to the same place, it's an instrument that could work because you're targeting uh, behavior change. And backyard composting uh, in small municipalities, uh, such as this one in Newfoundland, Cape St. George, um, even small municipalities that decided, hey, we want to, we don't want to truck all this organic waste to the local landfill, like the provinces, you know, telling us to because they don't have funding for collection of organics. This municipality gave out uh, backyard composters and told people how to use them really reduce their waste, significantly reduce solid waste uh, costs for the city, and uh, subsequent reductions on municipal solid waste bills. And the community has actually won an award for what they've done for a very small community. I've already mentioned the mandatory instruments here that uh, we we're seeing uh, as a trend. Uh, I've mentioned those already, so I'll just go ahead to the next slide in the interest of time. This, this diagram gives a key overview in terms of what's really the key message for the, the best practice approaches that we were able to identify. We see a lot of integration. We, we see this integrated solid waste management planning that starts with a strategic plan of some sort, not necessarily the official plan of the city, but some sort of strategy that deals with circular economy or, or zero waste uh, or solid waste management plan, some sort of strategic plan. We have specific goals that they've got in mind to support that plan with some action items. We've got a mix of mandatory instruments, some economic incentives for participation. Public education and ongoing is always, always something that those municipalities that have really made a change, this is something that they say it has been key. It's not just a rollout of an education campaign at the beginning of a new program or project. It's an ongoing thing. So they're the engagement with the public continues throughout the program. So uh, there's, there's not just waste audits to see if the messaging is happening uh, as it should, but it's, it's following up and it's saying, well, here's you know, what you could be doing that's uh, a, a little bit different from what you're doing right now. It's consumer awareness uh, uh, outreach, it's consumer awareness uh, surveys, um, and certainly the ICNI engagement is uh, also a key piece in terms of requiring requirements for the ICI sector to also have to divert the same amount of waste, recycle the same amount of organics um, with the last box on this uh, top left corner here. Diversion programs supplemented with the technologies that are suitable for the municipality. In some cases, that might be a, a large scale new technology. In some cases, it's a small technology. But all these various pieces come together to, uh, to plan the solid waste um, program for the municipality in a very integrated way. And those leading municipalities seem to be putting all kinds of these components together. Just uh, one last uh, example here of uh, one of the new technologies that uh, we were looking at. We've got a, bi a biofuel plant in Surrey and as well the biomethanization plant in Quebec. Both of these types of plants, I think they're a little bit different, but my understanding is uh, they both process organics from multiple municipalities. I believe the one in Quebec is over 20 municipalities all come to this one facility, including ICI sector waste, biosolids, and agri-food waste. The facilities are able to generate fuel from municipal building heating as well as uh, vehicle fleets and GHG emissions have been reduced by about 49,000 uh, carbon dioxide equivalent tons per year and municipal savings fuel biosol fuel biosolids disposal and waste disposal costs so significant savings for municipalities from uh, the implementation of these new uh, technologies which uh, I believe have I believe the bio biofuel plant in Surrey has won awards from FCM. My last slide here is the key success factors uh, which I tried to talk about throughout the examples, the importance of integrating the policies together across municipal programs, a mix of approaches, mandatory economic, uh, use of new technology where it makes sense to do so, continuous engagement of ICI, 
sector participants as well as the residential sector. And par partnerships and leadership of all municipalities, First Nations, uh, really is important in order to drive change, supplemented with provincial leadership and an important policy framework that can really help uh, municipalities is, uh, is what's happening at the provincial level, supportive voice goals and driving solid change throughout the waste planning process. Having a champion at the municipal level is also important because uh, it really can drive change in jurisdictions without the provincial support. All right, thank you very much. That's uh, my last slide. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Lori. That was a really great summary of how municipalities are able to drive change in the white sector and a good overview of those best practices that have those economic, social, and environmental benefits. It's great. So now we're going to be hearing from Joanne St. Goddard. Joanne has served as Executive Director of Recycling Council of Ontario, RCO, since 2001. And her expertise focuses on the development of policies, programs, and practices that advance the circular economy and drive positive environmental outcomes with market-based approaches. In doing so, uh, Joanne harnesses unique opportunities to facilitate relationships in public and private sectors that transition environmental imperatives and obligations into opportunities. She also works directly with municipalities to advance their environmental goals related to the circular economy and waste minimization through policy, including extended producer responsibility and disposal bans. Specifically, she leads creative initiatives that turn into, into circular economy concepts into action, custom, custom workshops for municipalities to develop circular procurement frameworks and implementation strategies, pilots that leverages municipal expertise and collection model to collect organic waste and rescue edible food from businesses, as well as innovative programs that support waste reduction for municipal and commercial sectors through Take Back the Light and 3 or Certify. Joanne, over to you. Thank you so much, Juliana. And first, uh, thank you to everyone who's taken time to be on the webinar today. And, and specifically, a thank you to Juliana and the work of the FCM in terms of bringing um, our important work um, and this information to the forefront. We really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I'm going to dive right in. And I just might start by saying it was really great to have Lori go in, 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 in front of me today just to sort of give us an affirmation that the things that we're working on are actually meeting where the trends are at for municipalities. So, uh, so um, we're, we're, um, we benefit from, from, from the work that, that she's done here as well. So I'm going to sort of zero in on a specific project and a partnership that we've um, been looking to uh, work with, specifically with the municipal sector. And the oddity is that um, we actually thought this work would have nothing to do with municipalities. And it turns out when we actually took the concept into practice, the municipal sector was actually the perfect partner. And in fact, we've done a bit of a 180. And you'll see by the title of, of the project that we're looking to reduce food waste and related materials to food waste um, in the non-residential and the ICNI uh, institutional sector. Um, and, and why that's most interesting is it really, again, links back to what Laurie was saying, which is that municipalities are actually doing more and more work, more and more services, more and more policy development that, in fact, um, uh, affects not only residential streams, but ICNI with the ICNI lens as well. Um, and the, there are many questions we're trying to answer with the pilot projects that we've been undertaking in this, in this uh, area, but we're really trying to do two things. One is look at regional collection for the ICNI sector um, that mimics what, what happens in the reg uh, residential sector, um, but then focusing on um, food waste in particular and uh, in so doing um, test a cooperative financial model. And I'll get into that in the slides. And my slides aren't advancing, so I'm just going to get a technical hand here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, oop, just given that this is a national audience and some may not have had the chance to work with us, 
Um, and uh, previously, uh, we have been doing, uh, you know, a, li a lot of work, as the name suggests, in Ontario, but really our work is actually taking us beyond the borders of Ontario. So we look forward to any municipality or other organization on this call that is outside of the province that wants to work with us and is interested in the work that we're doing. Um, we encourage you to get in touch. We've been around since 1978 and really, as the name suggests, focused on end-of-life management, in particular supporting more diversion into recycling um, and in an Ontario context. But the um, um, the in, uh, introduction of a circular economy and the circular economy lens has really afforded us the opportunity to pivot and look at more resource efficiencies that result in waste elimination or waste reduction. Um, and so everything that we do now as an organization is, is through the um, concepts and the practices that really underpin a circular economy and, and it's really been able to broaden our mandate. Most know that our CO is actually integral in forming or facilitating a public and private, meaning municipal and producer relationship to create what is now the Blue Box program and has gone through the machinations and evolutions of stewardship through to now um, individual producer responsibility under our new framework here in Ontario. Um, so I think, you know, we're sort of synonymous with the creation of the Blue Box, um, which services 98% of Ontario's population and diverts about 65% of residential packaging in the province. Uh, we're heavily involved in policy and advocacy work, um, not just at the provincial level, but actually with other provinces as well, um, but most recently because of the hyper focus on plastics at a federal level, we are in deep conversations and advocate at a federal level as well. We do a lot of programs and programs that again bring public and private interests together, but actually offer um, educational opportunities and resources to the general public and, and specific segments of our public. And we do a lot of research and pilot projects, like to tinker with concepts, um, trial them into practice, and then offer up results to um, sort of move us into best practices. Um, we're very transparent. Everything that we do is open uh, concepts and certainly um, uh, all the results, all of the work that we're doing um, are, are, are uh, offered up to anyone who wants to dig into the, into the information. And we certainly want and are encouraged to share the information. Um, our, our membership is very multi-stakeholder. We've got the entire supply chain as part of it. And so um, we know that collaboration between sectors is really what's going to offer up solutions. And so we do a lot of facilitation between government, private and public entities as well. And we're neutral, obviously outcomes based. We're looking for, um, you know, really moving the dial on resource efficiency uh, and waste reduction. So we're really um, environmental outcomes based. So just to sort of zero in on what we're focusing on now as an organization, and I'm getting used to this delay in the slides. Our current focus is really uh, the evolution of EPR, which is happening at different rates across the country. We're heavily involved, as I say, in those conversations and, and looking to take the learnings of what's happened in Ontario to other jurisdictions as well and what's happening here in our own province. Um, certainly, um, the surgence of uh, circular economy as a concept, uh, we're part and holding a side event of uh, what will be the World Circular Economy uh, Forum here in October in 2020. Um, and uh, we're actually very hyper-focused on procurement and how that drives supply chains um, to support more waste reduction and circular economy business models. And that really dovetails into, again, Lori's um, a trend around how municipalities are, in fact, using their per buying power, procurement in particular, to drive their broader public policy objectives, whether they be social, economic, and environment. And one of... Um, one of the benefits of the circular economy is really that you can be driving those broader public policy objectives almost simultaneously. So um, we believe that procurement is a very powerful tool and in fact should be something that municipalities in particular owning 80% of the procurement buy in Canada should be focused on. And uh, we're facilitating a lot of internal discussions, hosting workshops with the public works or waste or sustainable departments with in fact procurement and finance and those other um, departments within municipalities municipalities that have um, their thumb on the pulse of the budget and certainly have influences on what's bought and brought into uh, municipal infrastructure. So if you're interested in circular procurement work that we're doing, please do get in touch with us. Um, 
plastic waste, um, as is everyone uh, driving, trying to drive more domestic recycling markets by creating more demand. And so the conversation around improving post-consume recycle content, again, a direct link back to procurement, is of great importance to us. And we see that as a real important market driver that's really at this point untouched. Um, so a lot of potential there. And then, of course, that link to the ICNI, which is where the bulk of the waste that's generated in Canada is actually ending up in disposal. Some of our programs, if you're not familiar with them, they're listed here. You'll have access to the slides. So I encourage you to visit any of these programs. Um, they're very specific in some cases. Plastic bag grab is, is self-explanatory. I give a shirt is, is specific to textiles. Um, and I and three are certified is specific to the ICNI sector. So if you are interested in learning more about the uh, programs that we are uh, hosting and owning and offering up, please do um, visit us. So I spoke about advancing the circular economy and really, um, again, everything that we do as an organization is looking at this lens. And this is the, the graphic that we go back to in all of our activities as an organization. And for us, um, the concepts are sound, they're proven in other jurisdictions where they're more mature. And so it's really about using these concepts but driving action and that's where we are as an organization and that's why pilot projects are so important to us so the pilot project that i'm going to talk about today is actually going to address the, the uh, shaded aspect of this circular economy graphic which is really production and consumption cycles with um, some uh, um, uh, leverage points involved so the pilot project on food waste that i'm going to talk about uh, will address developing markets for recycled materials or in this case, compostable material, uh, reducing process waste, uh, which is self-explanatory, promoting reuse, and will be um, that is linked to rescuing edible food, improving collection. So we're testing this regionally based collection uh, model, and then encouraging more recycling as well of the packaging that's part of of, of, um, of recovering uh, food that is prepackaged that needs depackaging. So um, again, this is another graphic that our entire team uses as we, um, as we trial ideas and pilots. These are the five circular business models. And I encourage you, if you're just trying to, starting to learn about, um, about the circular economy and what it actually means, and most importantly, how it's different from just recycling, I encourage you to get to know these very, um, uh, these underpinning business models that really drive a circular economy outcome. Circular supplies, uh, resource recovery, product life extension, sharing platform and product as a service. So these uh, business models, some are very um, innovative um, and they're very uh, different from current linear business model practices. But as you start to understand these five business model deliveries, it really starts to open your mind um, and, and explain how circular economy is actually different from recycling and how it offers more. So i um, happy to chat to anybody who's interested in that. Again, for the purposes of this pilot project, there are really three that we are testing. One is circular supplies, so supply a fully re renewable, recyclable, or biodegradable resource um, into supporting a circular production. And again, that's recovering uh, food and food waste and the packaging associated uh, resource recovery, again, that's uh, back to the fundamentals of recycling um, and collection. And then that sharing platform, which is how can we use um, a cooperative finance model to share the service on a regional basis of collecting uh, organics. So before I get into um, the very first pilot project that led us to the second that I'm going to talk about today, maybe what I can do is give you some background on why RCO was interested in doing this. First and foremost, we knew that um, a very large part of the materials collected in the ICNI sector that were going to disposal were actually uh, organic materials. So we knew as an organization that if we wanted to affect change, we really needed to try to help resolve the issues around, around organics and organics collection. And tied to that um, on an environmental benefit is not only just the diversion and the collection of food and food related materials to uh, valuable composting, but actually the greenhouse gas emissions avoidance from diverting them from landfill. And coupled with that, the um, financial costs, but also the GHG costs or emissions associated with transporting organics materials as well. So we knew that there would be intuitively, there would be 
um, a very large economic and um, environmental impact of uh, doing better as it relates to diverting food and food waste from the industrial commercial institutional sector. And so in thinking about that, we thought through what, what, are, what are, how do municipalities who are collecting green material or are successfully diverting organics, um, what are they doing and why is that different? Why can't we replicate that in the ICNI sector? And there's some really key differences to um, to 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 the to the two that are to the two sectors that are that are um, worth noting. First, in the municipality side, we know that it is the services taxpayer based, and so it's part of the tax role. And um, citizens, and, you know, the municipality makes a decision. This is where I'm going to actually invest in in my infrastructure, in my collection, and I'm going to service my resident to try to divert um, uh, uh, organics. So the 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 um, Motivation might be slightly different. You may be protecting space in a landfill. You may be just wanting to do the right thing. You may be wanting to um, justify investments in in, uh, in composting infrastructure. Um, but irrespective of the actual motivator, we know that it's paid for by taxpayers, which is not the case in the ICNI sector. We also know that municipalities can build good economies of scale because their service level is always door to door. And so that door to door service really helps to reduce transport costs, which when we looked at the costs of servicing any kind of material away from disposal, transport is always the most costly. So if you can address the transport issue, then you can make diversion more um, uh, feasible. And of course, they have the opportunity because they have standardized programming to do mass education. So they can, at several points throughout the year, using several mechanisms to actually educate their their constituency, their taxpayer. You can talk about programs. You can you can um, uh, send out calendars. You can talk about the benefits. Um, you can you can generate websites that all of your taxpayers or your your constituency can go to. So there's real important mass education opportunities that again aren't that can't be replicated at the moment in the ICNI sector. And the other piece um, to that the differentiator is really good, excellent data, um, particularly in Ontario and I know um, in other provinces and on even uh, through Stats Canada federal level, there's really good data that's being amassed that helps us um, quantify the opportunity, quantify the cost, and so that data is really what underpins any activity, um, any investment, and any policy direction. And in the ICNI sector, we have all recognized that 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 there is very little data, and the data is not real time, and the data is not actually um, as sound as it could um, be um, in in the residential sector as well. And sometimes that lack of information is really what paralyzes us and most governments in moving forward in the ICNI sector. So putting all that aside. That's the backdrop to why our CO thought, you know what, one of the things we need to do um, is maybe think about what are the successes that we can take from the residential service model and actually replicate that in the ICNI sector. What are the benefits to doing that? So we took this concept and we actually started to call ICNI service providers. Um, but very quickly, we had municipalities that said, you know what, um, we're going to start making some investments in our organics infrastructure, in, in our services. And in order to justify those investments, we need supply. And so that supply that's being generated in the ICNI sector is critical to us to justify the expense in order to build that. So not only do we want to divert and collect residential material, we actually want to go after the ICNI sector, but we have no data. And so they were very keen. Many municipalities in Ontario actually approached us to say, I would love to host this pilot because I will have a line of sight into the data and maybe the behavior around what's different or what's necessary to service the ICNI sector to justify, again, my investment. So really mimicking residential best practices um, was, a, was the underpinning to pilot number one held in 2018, and it was hosted by the region of Durham. And um, it was really two tests that we were looking at. Could you regionalize collection and centrally consolidate um, in an operational model to, again, reduce, uh, reduce transport costs, those logistics that are sometimes expensive, um, and consolidate materials um, so that you can stage them in a way that is uh, beneficial to the end processes. Um, and connected to that, um, rather than each of the ICNI generator um, 
paying for its own individual service. And you know, the, again, major difference between ICNI and residential is the ICNI sector um, really works on their own. They subcontract address by address. The truck may, you may have 17 different trucks going down one street because each of the ICNI generator, um, you know, doesn't have a relationship with its neighbor. And so that regional collection model is not feasible. Um, so therefore you push up the cost. So could we create a cooperative financial cost share model for the users of this regional collection consolidation model? And really, we were targeting three um, sub uh, streams, if you will, of organics, obviously source separated organics, which is the lion's share. But we also wanted to try to rescue edible food for safe consumption and then packaged foods that require depackaging as well. Because one of the things that we heard from our ICNI members is I don't want three different trucks for three different things. Is there a way that you can service? All, I generate all three, and I would like to have one service model for all three streams. And everyone sort of raises their eyebrows, on, eyebrows around the edible food safe for consumption part, because as we know, contamination and food safety is really, really important. And we can talk about how we ended up addressing that issue. So we held this um, small pilot um, in, 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 uh, uh, between July and November in 2018. And uh, here's just three quick bullet points to tell you how it went. We had under 100% participation and literally what we did is we went door to door. We had a catchment of about 75 kilometers, um, literally almost in a circle. We went door to door to each ICNI generator type. And that's everything from a daycare to a mall, to a, a funeral home and to a convention center. And we asked each of them if they were first interested in, in trialing this with us, if they generated organics and if they knew how much they were generating, um, which of the three streams were commonly in their waste stream, do they have a line of sight on how much they spend on disposal. So we had a survey that we asked several questions and we amassed, um, and out of the, the each of the generators that we uh, knocked on the door, 100% of them said, absolutely, I'm prepared to do this. I want to just um, give you a caveat that um, we did get 100% participation because we, we were sponsored by Walmart Federation, or sorry, Walmart Foundation. And so we were able to actually pay the transport and the organics processing for the period of the pilot project. So it was free for those generators. But having said that, there was a requirement that they actually change the way that they manage this material on site. So we really had to have dedicated space. They really had to have um, reciprocals and they had to actually train staff to source separate these materials for the purposes of us collecting it. Um, the results were a diversion of 13.5 tons, so um, quite a bit of, of material for that short period of time of source separated organics um, from 17 very diverse generators in a small region. And we rescued over 2,000 pounds of food, which was equivalent to about 2,000 meals. So we felt we were onto something. We thought these results exceeded our expectations. And we were surprised actually that post pilot, 100% of the generators all wanted to continue the service, even if at cost. So I'll go through um, more of the, the details of the key findings. More than 50% of generators produced more than 50, or between 50 and 150 kilograms, 110 to 330 pounds of organic material weekly, despite a wide diversity of type of generator. And I list some of them there that we serviced. And what that told us is that in fact, many of those would be that 50% would be described as small generators. And, 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 and there were two sort of key um, reasons why that mattered. We do have a regulation in Ontario that requires where feasible large generators in the ICNI sector to source separate materials for diversion and uh, compostable. There's not empirical values and unfortunately there's no consequences um, to not participating. It's a very sort of loosey-goosey regulation. But when we look at how the province defines large versus small, small would have been captured by this 50%, which means they were really under the threshold of regulation. So even when you do have a regulation, the bulk of the generators, or at least half of the generators, would fall under that de minimis and in fact you would lose that material. 
participating generators were keen to change man to the change management approach. So we were anticipating people slamming the door in our face or saying, you know what, I don't have time for this. I don't have space for this. I don't have time to to, to um, train my staff. Given that they were SMEs or small to medium sized enterprises, we thought, you know, these, these these folks have a very small staff and they're run off their feet. But that was, in fact, the opposite. They were keen to do it. They were keen to take the time. And in fact, most of them um, did a really good job in sort of separating um, our our the change management side to to these operations and efforts were actually very very low and we were super pleased with with the um, really embracing the opportunity. Diverting organics from the waste stream could result in a reduction of disposal costs from as much as 60 percent and this really um, gave us gave us pause. For those that were able to get feedback, just want to make sure that we're okay. Okay, great. For those that were able to um, uh, provide or and were willing to give us their disposal costs, when we did a comparison of their disposal versus their organics diversion, they were uh, able to save 60% of their costs against disposal. So that's a really meaningful number. And we felt that it was the first sort of window into um, creating the business case as to why the ICNI sector should really be diverting organics. Despite the significant amount of materials diverted to composting, participants would fall under that threshold. So I covered that um, in the earlier point. And then contamination rates of participating general, uh, generator materials were actually very, very low. So the other common sort of misconception was, oh, you know, the, the material is going to be very dirty. These are small to medium-sized enterprises. This is, or you know, these are big businesses. They don't have time to sort of separate. They don't have time to, to effectively train their staff. But in fact, that was not actually the case. The materials had less than 5% contamination, um, and um, the organic composter partner was very, very happy with the material. So, um, um, last page with key findings. Um, identifying and recruiting participants required time. So, we because we did choose to go door to door, um, and and really it, we were really on the ground. We were and we needed to to do a bit of backgrounder on. Uh, we needed to take some time um, to to provide some information, some good information. So it did take time. We did learn that the rescue food, uh, the food that we did rescue, had a very short shelf life. In fact, had to be consumed within 12 hours. So it wasn't your typical dry goods, it was actually pre-made meals, which we made use of, but we had to pivot and, and really be flexible on how to use that. Um, generators expressed a willingness to us to pay for more for separated organics, but they had a threshold, of course. Um, if they did have to pay, they were observing the costs and uh, they, they, you know, they, they wanted um, some ceiling, of course, on those costs. A um, lot of support from front, frontline staff and, um, really not a lot of change, I guess, for the local waste collection service provider to be able to create new routes. Um, we didn't, in fact, in this pilot, um, have enough uh, tonnage to warrant a consolidation site. In fact, we did manage edible food in another stream or a separate stream. So we didn't test the consolidation site. It's something that we want to do in the next pilot. And one thing that we did not anticipate that was very, very valuable was the local involvement and support of the local BIA, who proved to be um, um, instrumental and very helpful in identifying key businesses. So in 2020, uh, we want to take this pilot project, all of our learnings and our outstanding questions, trial a larger area for a longer period of time, and we found a home to do that. The City of Guelph and the County of, Region, uh, of, of Wellington, who have won um, the Smart Cities Challenge under their Our Feud Future campaign, have um, expressed a willingness and will be hosting um, the, the second pilot. We do already have additional partners to date in Provision Coalition, the Second Harvest, and the University of Guelph. The university is going to help us with some data collection and measurement of KPIs. We have a broadened set of objectives. Some are repeat, but some are broadened in terms of what we want to do with this pilot. We certainly want to replicate the outcomes of pilot in 2018, but we want to apply that to expanded service area with a larger sample of generators. We want to, we didn't get a, 
um, enough um, information on costing to, to trial or model this idea of a cooperative financial model. We're thinking about a membership-based model that you join with a membership and then pay as you go in terms of use, so tonnage. Um, and that's something we're going to be doing in this model as well that reduces the overall costs for all of the individuals, but then on mass as, as we create the service region to encourage more participation, knowing that cost is really a barrier. We want to test the feasibility of situating a central consolidation system to service um, the region and to reduce those transport costs and the impacts of transporting uh, SSO. Um, we want to improve upon this edible food referral service that we created in 2018. Really, in real time, um, what we did was we, we facilitated a relationship between um, uh, restaurants and, and generators that were creating edible food that needed to be consumed in that 12 hours with the local food banks that were, were wanting the, mat the material and the, and, the, and the meals, and in fact were appreciating it because what it did was cut down on their volunteer time. Most food banks rely on volunteer hours to create meals. We were able to get them prepared food that they were um, then really ease the burden off their mini volunteers. So they that that was a new discovery for us, and again, something we did not anticipate. Uh, we want to trial the opportunity needs and costs associated with depackaging. We didn't get any depackaged food in this in our first pilot. We want to extend and make sure in our circle of service that there is somebody that is generating that material. And then, of course, track and report all the uh, KPIs associated with the triple bottom line. My slides are giving me grief. So this is just a schematic of how we think it's going to look. Um, and um, the KPIs are listed here again in the triple bottom line, uh, environmental, social, and economic. And I just maybe touch on the social, the costs avoided with consolidated collection and transport. Certainly that has an economic overlap to it as well. And then um, uh, improve security through donations and recovered meals and quantify new employment opportunities due to increased diversion. Actually, social and economic are flipped there, my apologies. Um, it should be environmental, economic, and then social, but it shows you all of the KPIs we'll be measuring. And then the next steps, we'll be making a public announcement soon on the new partnership. We are now securing funding and we'll be going to the FCM Green Fund for the first round of phase one. We are amassing a project advisory committee. So if you are interested and you want to get involved and this is something that you want to maybe transplant or be involved in this test and see if you want to test it in your municipality, we'd be happy and pleased to hear from you. Um, and then confirm all the data collection points and the methodology uh, with that advisory committee as well. We'll be onboarding a project manager and confirming participation of the service providers as well. So sorry to go through that so fast. I know we have limited time. I'm more than happy to take questions as uh, Juliana facilitates for us. Um, so thanks, Joanne. That was a really great overview of the pilot. Um, we're already past 2.30, so we've run out of time. Um, for the questions, I believe. I, I apologize. Uh, what I would recommend is for those who ask questions to please reach out directly to uh, Joanne and Lori for further information. Um, if you do have to leave, the, the session is being recorded, so not to worry. I think we're just going to jump really quickly into the funding and then close. So we'll just move on to the next slide. Um, sorry about that. So for the GMF funding, um, it is available to all municipal governments and their partners. We do provide grants for studies and pilots, as well as a combination of loans and grants for capital projects. GMF's waste funding stream involves two categories of projects. So the first one is for initiatives that have the potential to help you divert at least 60% of municipal solid waste from your landfill or move behind beyond the 60% if you've already achieved that. Um, if you are from a remote community, uh, the goal is to achieve a diversion rate of 15% over your current baseline. Examples of what you might implement are those on the screen, as well as sewer separation of waste and waste management systems that increase the diversion of waste from landfills. Another category that we fund are for initiatives that address specific waste stream challenges, uh, like biosolids, diapers, polystyrene, certain plastics, and other, other things. And there's a, still a couple of examples on the screen of what we might fund. 
A third category is our new signature initiatives uh, category, which is designed to accommodate those transformative best-in-class municipal projects that don't necessarily fit into these two sections. So those are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So please reach out to an advisor using the email on the screen, gmfinfo at stm.ca to find out a bit more information. A quick reminder to join us next week for our last webinar of the series on, muni on the municipal water sector. We'll be hearing about water management trends, issues and best practices, as well as the beneficial use of technological and geodigital solutions from the City of Toronto. And before you go, we'd really appreciate you taking the time to just fill out a very quick survey to help us narrow or focus for our next few webinars. So big thank you to our presenters, Joanne and Lori. That was really great. And thank you uh, all for an engaging session. We look forward to seeing you next week.